we celebrate our successes together as a team. No matter, no matter which individual created it, you know, if people aren't making the odd wrong decision, it means they aren't making decisions. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today was a professional rugby union player turned health club operator who made his name in the fitness sector working for JJB Health Clubs as their national operations manager. Following a successful journey, he had the opportunity to work with the retail mega brand JD Sports and to head up a new fitness concept that went on to become JD Gyms. Starting with a bold vision, he was able to build a team and revolutionize the affordable fitness sector with fair pricing and a sensational environment that has helped them to expand the brand to over 70 gyms in the UK. In this week's episode, we cover several topics, including why are more fitness brands not combining their fitness product with a strong retail offering? What role does social media play in designing JD Gyms? And the innovation behind creating a successful business in the fitness industry. So please welcome the Managing Director of JD Gyms, Mr. Alan Peacock. Mr. Alan Peacock, it's been a long time. Thank you for joining us on the Escape Podcast. You're very welcome. I've listened to this for the last few years, so it's great to finally be talking to you. Fantastic. So, so just, uh, you know, initial question, you know, how's it going? It's, uh, it's since we've last spoke, a, a lot's kind of happened. A, a, a long time has, has passed, but it seems as though it's a very short time in terms of, you know, picking back up from where we left off. But what, you know, how, how's things been going over the last few years? Well, things have been pretty crazy over the last few years. I mean, COVID obviously came along a couple of years ago. And uh, I think every time somebody sees me now, they say they think it's been a year or two and actually it's been three or four. I think <laughs> generally speaking, we all lost a couple of years in all of that time. But no, it, it's going incredibly well. You know, I'm, I, I'm the custodian of a, of a great job and great position here. I'm very lucky and privileged to be leading a phenomenal business. Um, and, you know, we're continuing to grow. We feel as though we've hit a real... A real niche in the industry and it's uh, it's pretty cool and it's going really well thank you so the uk market then because it's been for me it's almost been three years since i've seen a lot of my friends and family i've not, not been able to get back yet i'm planning to do that this year but what's what does the uk market look like post the pandemic you know are there any dominant new models new players has, has there been any significant changes probably after, over that sort of three to four year period would you say well, I think it does look different from when you were last here. I think, I think the biggest change obviously has come around post-COVID with people's working habits being different, you know, the way that they live their life, the amount of time they spend at home, the amount, amount of time they spend at leisure and the amount of time they spend in the office. That, that's always going to change things. You know, typically the, there was a lot of the dominant players in the UK market had a significant presence inside city centres. And I think, you know, like it probably is across the rest of the world, that, that's the market that's been hit the hardest. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think in, in inside the city centres, you're seeing the boutiques and you're seeing the, the, the traditional uh, core uh, big players probably suffering more than most. We're really fortunate because we the vast majority of our estates are based out in the suburbs. They're not we're not really a city centre business. We've got three what I would call core city centre sites, um, and they're doing okay. But in the main, the sites that we have outside of the, of the cities are doing phenomenally well because people's working patterns are different, working from home, got a little little more spare time and time to go to the gym. As far as dominant players go, I think I think the big change for me has been a shift. You know, it's pretty obvious there's been a shift into to the growth area being in low cost. Uh, and I think that that is in parallel with a more youthful member typically. You know, when I first got into the industry, I was working in a, in a business that was charging, you know, for a standard gym, 30, 40 quid a month. What you've got now is some super gyms 20 years later that are charging half that price. And it's opened up a new market for, for a much younger member. And, and also with the advent and, and growth of social media, that just makes it continue to grow. So, so for me, the, the landscape has, has changed. I remember my old boss, Graham, my, my, my first mentor, Talk to me about the the key to the industry being in the grey market. I, I don't know whether that's because he was he was one of those people <laughs> or not, uh, but he talked about making sure that you know you go after the grey pound. Well, well for us now it's it, it's changed. You know I've ended up with JD Gyms in a in a business that's become self fulfilling in the way that we design the sites, the way that we the kind of music that we play, the atmosphere that we generate. And I, I didn't really ever set out for that. I wanted the model to be a little more. Um, across 
a variety of different uh, elements and demographics. I think as we got to realize that the, the cooler we made it, the younger we got, but the younger we got, that's where the real fertile ground was for us. So, so we've ended up with a business now where, where we have 75% of our members under the age of 34. Mm. And, and and yeah, that, that, that for me has been a big shift. And you see a lot of that in, in, in the low cost. And, and again, across most industries and across most countries, it's the middle market that's kind of either fallen away or got squeezed. You've still got still a place for high end products, you know, David Lloyd um, in the UK and the like are still there's very much still a place for them in the right locations. But but unquestionably, the mass growth is in those people that cater for the lower cost element of the market and the younger demographic for me. But the difference being that the low cost in the UK has no longer become no frills. Low cost in the UK becomes low cost. But the gyms just get bigger, they get better, they get better equipped, it becomes more competitive. And the people that, that fundamentally win more than anybody are those are those young members that have got a phenomenal choice amongst some of the best uh, best facilities in the world. There, there was a few, I guess, early entrepreneurs in the in the UK fitness industry. Mike Balfour would be one and I'd, certainly Dave Whelan. But Dave came at it from a very different perspective. So I suppose as a as an as a successful entrepreneur and as as a visionary, what, what what influence did he have on you and also the industry at the time? Well, we created a model that was really groundbreaking. You know, we were we were providing, we were the first people really, I believe, to provide swimming pools, gyms, uh, studios and classes in what was, I suppose, at that point into a lower cost element. At the time, the biggest competitor we had in the UK, ironically, is the business that, that they own today, which is Fitness First which at the time were providing, I suppose, something similar to what you'd see in today's low cost, which is a, a high quality product, but, but completely dry, no swimming pool. So we came along with what we felt was a was the next iteration of gym floor, the next iteration of, of classes. But we provided swimming pool, sauna, uh, steam room, jacuzzi, that type of thing. Um, and we provided it a similar price or even slightly lower. So at the time, it was a great place to be because we generally walked into a town regardless of the population, regardless of competition, and we were really successful. So, so we were we were kind of guys who were who started along and, and we were we were people who didn't have a huge heritage in the in the in the industry. Uh, we knew what we were doing, we were incredibly passionate, we 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 absolutely bled the business through and through and uh, learned on the job a little bit, I suppose, for the first five or ten. Uh, and in the end created a sensational business built around amazing customer care. You know, Dave's philosophy was always from the start to make sure that, that it was right. So we, we had a business that was built on quality first. You know, the guys out in the gyms didn't even look at the P&L, weren't overly concerned on sales targets. This was all about look after the members and the business looked after itself. So what you find when you get that is a culture of people that want to make sure the clubs are immaculately clean, that the member experience is perfect. I mean. NPS wasn't really really around them, but if it was, I'm sure we'd have a uh, we'd have a great store because the retention in those gyms, I've never seen it. I've never seen the like of that since. So, so I genuinely feel that what we created at that point um, was something that was was truly groundbreaking. And and Dave himself, you know, he's he's an inspirational guy. I'm from Wigan, so so I'm I'm the guy here who's, who's seen what he did with the football club. I've seen what he's done with the rugby club. I saw what he did as a professional sportsman. So, so across the town, generally, the people that know him and the people that have worked closely with him have got the utmost respect. They, they know that he's a, a you know, tough taskmaster. You know, you know, we've all probably got some stories about, about how, how tough Dave can be. But yeah, he, he, he instilled uh, things in me and the people in my business that have worked in that, in, in that organization that are invaluable, you know, cost control, like you've never seen before you know, this <laughs> business here where I get these young guys coming along and telling me it's all about sales. You know, you know, we still, we still keep an eye on the electricity meter because that never, <laughs> you never lose that once you work with Dave. But, but actually being really honest in the early days, my, my two bosses at that point, Barry and Graham, you know, when I was a young guy in the, in the game. So yes, I was running the business out in the clubs day to day, but Barry and Graham were the ones that I suppose, with a real filter and would deal with him more directly on a day-to-day -day basis. It was only towards the end of the uh, of my time at JJBDW that I, that I 
spent a little more time with him on one to one. When I used to, I, I remember Graham giving me a tour of the clubs. We were trying to do business with with you you guys at the time. It was in the early days, and I remember we worked with LA Fitness that had pools and were considering the cost of whether they should continue them. And, and I remember Fitness First, I think they had a pool in, Bur in, in Bournemouth and then they decided, look, there's, there's too much cost and hassle. So I got to know those two businesses pretty well. And then when I saw Graham, he, he took me into this pool and it wasn't just a regular pool. Um, he was, um, I, I, I think he had a background in the sort of nightclub industry from his ideas, but he, he would, had kind of like disco lights and it, 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 it was just an amazing, the pool was amazing. There was spa, um, there was amazing Group X studios, great team, you know, you'd walk through and the, the, the reception, he was obviously, or whoever was involved <laughs> had that dialed in because there was smiling faces and they were greeting you. And it, it was just this extremely well-run machine. And, and I remember at the time thinking, well, th there's some one, one group that's kind of going, going down one direction and then there's you guys that are at, sort of investing and, and seem to be able to do it at a, at a really amazing cost. So what do you think was the secret source? Because that, that model did work for quite some time and, um, and I, I, could, I never could put my finger on how, you know, both businesses were successful but they both had a very different approach to the club itself. Do you know what, what Matt, that's a great question. The, the, when you look back, you, at, at the time, you don't necessarily look at it like that, but you look back on your career and you think, you know, I've asked myself the same question and I've asked myself the same question as to what that time did for me. I think one of the things that I will say is that the makeup of the team was, was pretty spectacular. What you had is a lot of people with a lot of different skill sets and, and, and Graham in particular is an absolute one-off. So his, his attention to detail, his eye for design was something that I've never, ever seen before. And, and I suppose that came with a great flair as well. So he didn't have a background in the nightclub industry, but I'll make sure I tell him that the next time I see him. <laughs> said that. Um, no, he, he just he just cared so, so much. And, and you know, he was, he was the manager of the, of the Hotel Leisure Club that Mr. Whelan had to start off with. And I was a member and I just used to watch what he did. And this is a guy that knew every member's name. This is a guy that knew everything about the club. This is a guy that cared passionately. It was a bit of a retirement gig for him at that point. He, he'd done something different. And, and yeah, he, he, his attention to detail, both on design and amongst the people, and it didn't, it didn't matter who you were. In fact, if anything, it was more important to him the more unfashionable you were. You know, we used to have a saying that we you know, focus on the unfashionable, and we tried to get the staff not to just talk to the peer group or the ones, you know, the... the you know, the pretty young girls and the hunky young guys. This was all about finding those people, you know, finding the Mrs. Jones in there that, that comes in. You know, this is a person who feels vulnerable, hasn't been to a gym for a long time. Let's find out who that person is and let's get to know them. Same with the staff, same with the cleaning staff. You know, he, he used to call the cleaners member retention officers because he genuinely at that point felt as though they were the ones that could talk more to the members and, and actually empowered the cleaners to do the show rounds at one point because... If, if we had somebody in who we felt that they could relate better to, that's what we did. You know, this wasn't about some polished salesman at the front door. So it was different. It was innovative. It was, it was, it was something that was very, very different from what anybody else was doing. And I suppose when you marry the rest of the team off, Barry, who was the MD at the time, was, was a great businessman, really, really keen on the numbers. So all the things that Graham didn't really want to get involved in. Barry was the guy to do that, so a perfect foil. You know, he would do that and, and, and get involved in the numbers, work, work the corporate side, work the PLC side, work with banks and the accountants. And behind that, I was the young pup, really hungry and and just having having the time of my life and, and, and you know, going to work with a massive smile on my face and, and killing it wherever we went. And, and, yeah, and just, you know, having having great fun. Another, another saying we had, we had, we had fun, but we had fun with responsibility. We never lost sight of the fact of the things that we should and shouldn't be doing, but but yeah, we had a great time doing it. And and I look back on it, and it was everything from looking after the member, having a real key eye on design. So that's why still today, you know, we haven't created a cookie cutter business. Whenever we open a new site, I'm into the detail. My team are into the detail. They have to be into the detail on on the way that the tiling looks through to the way the color scheme, the lighting. I'm involved in all of that. So that means that the rest of the guys have got to be involved in that because it might be a gym now. You know, I'm in the fortunate position to sit here with 75 gyms in the UK. And unfortunately, I don't get to see some of them very often. 
but when I'm building that gym, I, I treat it like it's the one that I'm gonna that I'm gonna go to four times a week. And and so so yeah, there was a, there was a load of um, there, there was a load of elements that we learned in those early days that I now look back on. You know, people say to me, "You learn so much," and when you're in it, you don't necessarily realise because you're always looking at the things that other people are doing and what a fitness first doing, what are LA fitness doing, what are Canons doing, what are Nuffield doing. But actually what we perhaps didn't realize at that point is that I think people were looking at us and scratching their head and saying, how are, how are those guys doing it? And <laughs> yeah, we, we, had, we had a really cool team. We, 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 had, we, had, we had really bought in individuals. And I suppose that's, that's something that I've carried on. I've realized that, that, I'm, that I'm still in the people industry here. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm part of building um, <clears throat> a, a great physical product but as soon as I, as soon as I think that it's a physical product and not a people business, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm screwed. You know, when we open a new club, I stand in front of the PCs to this day. I talk to them all. I talk to them about where the business was born and, and how it came around. I might not see those guys again, or I might not see them for a year. Uh, and I talk to them very much about the fact that at that point, I'm handing them a facility. I'm handing them a really pretty gym. It looks great. The lighting's ace. The equipment's cool. It's a great place for them to go and run their business. But what they provide is the club. I provide the gym, and it's about how they how they talk to the members and how they conduct themselves. And and one of the things that we talk about in our business all the time is is we look for hands and not butts. So at that point, when people first join our business, and it's a philosophy that I've had since the start, it's about this is a phenomenal looking gym, and the staff are incredible, and it's clean, and the classes are great, and they always start on time, and my friends love it. As opposed to this is a great looking gym, but the staff aren't very friendly. But it's dirty. But the equipment's broken. So it's so it's the hands over the books for us, and and it might seem like a very small thing, but it's the thing that takes a well invested, great physical product into a phenomenal club. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. The retail combination is something that is fairly, it, it, from what I see, it's, it's quite a UK thing. Like we, we had uh, JJB originally, um, DW, uh, Mike Ashley with what they're doing with, um, with, Ev- with the Everlast brand. I'm just curious to know, because it seems like when, when you, and I, and I remember going back years ago when I looked, thought the model, you kind of had your, your retail, which I believe was downstairs. Was it downstairs or upstairs? Um, Often in, the, in JJB because the swimming pool was downstairs. Right, okay. So, yeah. so you kind of had the, the club, then you had the retail. And it, and it seemed as though now, in fact, I was at an event yesterday where there was a credit card company and, and they were giving away all this free stuff so that they could um, get the details of people that are interested in health and fitness because it was a very targeted demographic and that data was worth a lot of money for people. So I guess what you were doing is, is creating almost like this targeted audience who are interested in the brand and... And, and would be interested in a lot of the stuff that was that was being sold. So I, I guess I'm curious in terms of that that model itself, because I, I know in, in terms of the JJB, it, it, it didn't quite continue as, as um, it, it, it didn't continue and they're, and they're not here today. But do, do you think that that is a mod, you know, obviously it's part of what you guys do, but, but you know, why do you think there's probably not more of those collaborations between fashion brands and, and gyms or, or just traditional retail and gym? You know, why isn't Nike in the gym business um, or Puma or anyone like that? What, what are your thoughts on that? I think, I think it's a difficult question to ask, uh, to answer as to, as to why the people aren't. I think, I think the reason why the three main retailers across the last 20 years, sports retailers in the UK are, uh, because of the pioneering things that happened at JJB. I think that I think that had that not happened, I'm not so sure it would have happened at Sports Direct and, and would it have happened at JD. I think it spawned it in the UK. 
but it, but if you know, yes, the cross fertilization element of it is 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 important, but it's never been the key in in both of the sports retailers that I've worked with. Um, the two businesses fundamentally stand on the stand on their own two feet. You know, so when you're in a, a unit where there's a gym and a, and a retail store, it isn't about the the gym going in there to support spending retail. That that's a nice extra nice to have. But fundamentally, it's probably more to do with with sweating the property asset. Most sports stores at that point would be double height, and 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 the business that I used to work for instantly thought, you know what? How can we fill this huge void above us? Put a floor in here. What can we do? Well, we don't need more retail space because we've already got it. Because we need that all on one floor because that's the way the shopping experience needs to look. I don't know we've we've got a gym down the road that seems to be doing pretty well, and it seems like it's bringing the same people in. Let's see how that goes. And and, and at the time, I think that 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 ran that ran really well, um, and I think it spawned it spawned the work that, that's gone on at, at, at Sports Direct, and, and to a lesser degree, I think for us because we do it slightly differently at JD. We actually at the seventy five units only have one combined unit with JD, so 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 the JD Gyms business is is very much a standalone business. This is a very different model. We don't take the same property. We've got one in in Salford, in fact, it's just outside of Manchester. Uh, and that was that. That fundamentally was a property that JD fancied. They had excess space, and I said, "Okay, I'll I'll, I'll pick up the slack and I'll come in there with you." But it's but it's you know this is where it works together. We'll do it, but it's never about the the key cross fertilization story. And I think to be honest with you, that's probably going to become going to become even more relevant as more and more people buy online. So so what we will be looking to do is introduce the kiosks into the gyms where people can. Uh, shop the product. They can have a look at it. They can they can order order things in. And we're looking at a, um, a, a pilot where we're putting some lockers inside the gyms so people can order the product and pick it up the following day. I think that's probably going to be more relevant for us than it is the the typical kind of dual fascia in the same in the same premises. And that's largely to do with the fact that for us, typically in gyms, what you'll find is that the rent profile is is a little lower than it would be on prime retail. You know, JD is is, is the world's number one uh, sports fashion retailer and will typically go for prime pitch that is that is very retail driven. For a leisure business to go into that space and be competitive is difficult because typically what you're doing is you're paying, you're paying extra for the retail benefit of those people that are shopping at Primark or at Boots or at JD. When in reality, that can be more of a nuisance than if you've got a standalone unit that's cheaper rent somewhere else that people are just going for the leisure destination. So, so the rent profile, I think, is probably a key reason why you wouldn't necessarily do it because what works for Nike or Puma or JD from an A1 prime retail location is, is probably pretty expensive by the time it gets to it. So you're then into something that is purely there to feed the to feed the retail element as opposed to stand on its own on its own two feet. So that that I would think is probably the primary reason. And how does that how does it, the brand work? <clears throat> you know, does it do, do you think it um, it sort of really, I suppose, um, enhances what is happening at retail, even if it's separate, you know, the fact that you, you're now sort of the market leaders, I guess, um, in fitness itself, do, do, do you think there's there's crossovers into what's happening with the with the other side of the JD business at all? Yeah, definitely. Well, I certainly like to think so. You know, there's no question that we that we have tailored the design of the JD gyms to ensure that the that the consumer understands that it that it all tells you know part of the same story. That's really really important to us. When when the chairman Peter Cargill and myself first started to talk about the idea of, of, of a gyms business, it was only very late in the day that we decided to call it JD Gyms. At one point, this was about JD investing in a business that didn't actually carry the fascia. The, the business is so successful and the brand is so strong. It, it's, it's a pretty big call for, for me to be able to look after a business with the JD brand on it. You know, so there had to be a lot of trust that it was going to work. When you've built something up over at that stage, 35 years, it, it's, it wasn't an easy sell for me to say, no, I think this is going to be better as JD. And, and the promise that I gave to the board at that point is that whilst I, you know, it's got to still um, be a be a business that works and is profitable in its own right. I will a definitely not tarnish the mother brand, but b genuinely believe that I'll do something that will really enhance it. And 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 that's where I feel we are now. When we had seven or eight gyms, you can't you know most people in most parts of the UK never heard of JD gyms. 
And to a point in certain parts of the UK, that's still the case. But the more and more that goes, the more and more we're, we're targeting the same consumer and actually we're, you know, creating the arenas, I suppose, in which you can use some of the products. So, hmm. so yeah, I think there's there's no question about it now. It's it, it is it is definitely brand enhancing. But but the flip side of that is it's been an incredible um, element of, of helping me make JD Gyms a success because the strength of the brand just gives a great trust and credibility. You know, at times when I'm when I'm pre-selling in an area where someone's perhaps never heard of it before, as soon as you as soon as they understand that it's JD Gyms, they've got the trust. They'll join the gym two or three months in advance because they know it's going to be of a certain quality. Hmm. I was quite surprised as I started to read about JD and the, and the story. Um, I think it was in the 80s. I read first door in Manchester, 81. I didn't realize they were such a, they were a global, they had a huge global footprint in, in Asia and um, even in the US. Um, big flagship store opened last year in Times Square, which I, which I wasn't aware of. Um, and they're owned, I didn't realize that they're owned by an even bigger company that has a whole sort of um, a list of, of other well-known brands. So it's, so it's quite a powerhouse that you've, um, that you've got behind you, I guess, in terms yeah. of potential. Um, I, did, with the footprint of them being a global business, it, did you see that um, in terms of where you're going with DW? And obviously, I don't want to sort of get you to make any statements that, that you can't sort of, uh, you can't share. But do, do you see that, if, that JD, particularly with some of your acquisitions, is, is going to, you know, become more of an international brand over time? Um, or, you know, you're going to sort of stick to, to, to the model that you've got currently? What you soon learn when you work in this business is that is that there is no there is no kind of um, horizon that, that can't be breached. You know, this is this is a business that is incredibly professional, but, but opportunistic and entrepreneurial beyond the likes of which I've ever seen before. So, you know, if you'd have asked me that question at 30 clubs pre pandemic, I'd have said probably at some point, but not yet. We then in that first lockdown um, managed to secure the acquisition of Exercise for Less to administration, doubled in size. Most organizations at that point, you know, batten down the hatches, let's consolidate. Okay, let's just let's let's just make sure that we've we've got the ability to run this business. For us, it, it, it actually put the foot on the accelerator because instantly overnight it became JD Gyms became something more significant within the wider group and and then it felt as though it could become something quicker particularly the, the success of the acquisition, you know, how, how, how easily we took it on board and how successful those sites have been since. So, you know, there's no question about it. We've, um, yeah, we're, we're, looking to, we're looking to do whatever is next. We've, we've recently acquired a majority stake in a business in the UAE that was a, an entirely opportunistic piece of business. Um, so, we, yeah, we, we took that on. It's not because we were looking to, to for a, a base in Dubai as the first one outside of the northwest of England. It just so happened that it was a great business with a, with a phenomenal management team. And, and yeah, we, we, we liked the look of it and we thought that this is a great way to test the market overseas. Uh, that one still isn't branded JD Gyms at this point. And, uh, and the guys very much fundamentally run that business. But yeah, it's it's definitely increased and wet the appetite for further international expansion quicker, I suppose, than we would have than we would have certainly thought a couple of years ago. Mm. I've I was um, I mentioned before I was at an event and it, and it seemed yesterday or last couple of days actually, and I, and I suppose I've I've spoke to a lot of people in in the space, suppliers, operators, and it's been a very, very tough time. But it was, a, it was a fitness tech summit I went to and there was people like Microsoft and Strava and a number of people that you would class as being outside of the industry. And they were talking about their plans of coming into the space from a technology and, and, a, and a number of different sectors. And, and their view is, look, this is the hottest thing. Health, fitness, wellness is, is, is huge and we're gonna be dumping loads of money into it. And, and I suppose you've got a lot of the traditional businesses that are still coming off the back of a pretty tough time. Being part of a, of a bigger organization, Pentland Group, like just, they seem to be just very smart and clean and execute extremely well. Um, with, you know, did, did, did these sort of, you know, a lot of the smart people that are involved, did they, did they, are they very optimistic about the, the space and um, and in with, with in terms of what you're doing, are you able to, I suppose, capitalize on 
a lot of that a lot of those smart people that have that have done very well in in sort of retail and apply some of that knowledge and expertise into the relatively new health and fitness market yeah so so the, the bits that i need and the bits that i want yes the bits that i don't think are useful no and and that again just feeds into and talks into the the the, the incredible nature of this business that, I, that i'm involved in you know I, Founded the business plan for JD Gyms as a minority shareholder, backed by JD. And, and at that point, when I, when I was sitting with Peter and we talked about it, he said, look, there is, a, there is a machine that sits here and there are bits of it that are going to be really useful for you. Where you think it's going to be more useful than doing it yourself, I want you to use it, but don't distract them from, from doing what they're doing. Okay, Because at this point, we've got, we've got zero gyms, I suppose. But where you feel as though you can do it better because you're the specialist, I want you to do it yourself. I don't ever want you coming back to me and saying, well, I didn't really want to run my marketing like that because. So, so what, what we've done from the start is we've, we've utilized all the phenomenal expertise that sits inside that organization from IT to HR to property to finance, all those core central functions. It doesn't really matter whether you've got a brands business, you've got a retail bricks and mortar business, or you've got a gyms business. It, it fundamentally is the same thing. Where it's more bespoke, uh, we've still done that ourselves. So, so the core marketing is still done within my, my team here, my specialist marketing team that, that, that understand this industry. Uh, I suppose to answer your question about uh, are they are they kind of seeing the the traction behind the space? Yeah, I think that's pretty I think that's pretty true. And they're looking at the success of JD Gyms also and thinking, you know, this is now a vehicle that, that we want to support. Uh, again, with a business that's so enormous, you've got you've got small business such as JD Gyms, that when it is still really small, I suppose there's elements of it being confusing as to you know why we're we doing this and is this really core cool for us? The bigger that we get and the more successful we are, the more that we get brought into that. So so yeah, I think more and more and more, and I think the recent international acquisition was a real was a real eye opener. It might feel like it's only seven clubs, but it's a it's a genuine watershed for us in the business, you know, as was buying X for L. We've got other things in the pipeline that we're working on at the moment that are really, truly exciting. And, and yeah, it's within the business. I couldn't, I couldn't ask for it to be any different. And I'm not just doing that in a kind of sycophantic way. Genuinely, you know, the, the, why would I not leverage phenomenal IT expertise or property or finance or HR with a business that's as big as it is? Uh, but then equally, why would I want to tap into that when they've never run a gym before on the things that, that, are, that are really cool? So, so we've got we've got a really good balance. And, you know, they trust me and my team. I've got vast majority of my guys in senior positions here have been with me from very early stages. Um, yeah, and, 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 the, and they're backing it. And I think, that, I think maybe you need to ask them at some point, but I, I think they're pretty excited to be where we're headed. <laughs> I remember we were at an event and I don't know what the event was, but we, it was kind of towards the end of the night. We'd, we'd had a few drinks and I remember you telling me about this new opportunity oh, um, because there was, there was some work going into preparing for this. There's a bit of a journey. Yeah. You didn't just sort of open the clubs. And I remember you telling me, you know, this vision of, look, this is what we're going to do and they're going to be like this and you're going to do things very, very differently. And I, I have many conversations as, as I'm sure you do of people sort of talking about what they're going to do and how great it's going to be but yeah. you know, there's only a few people I've met I could probably count them on one hand that have actually gone and done that and as I was researching the podcast I went and I was on social media and online and looking at some of the clubs that I'd hope to see one day and you you actually delivered exactly and I remember we were both standing there sort of I, I just probably somewhere in Birmingham or wherever I can't remember but it, or it might even be London but I, I just remember that conversation very very clearly and and you know I was quite excited about the vision and and, and you've gone on to do it now I suppose bringing that to today you're, you're you're still kind of around this 1999 no contract amazing equipment from what I can see and and I suppose you know jumping forward almost a decade is it still possible to achieve that? Because I, I guess in this post-pandemic world, um, you know, the equipment costs are, are going up for, for everybody. The, the, so, you know, a big part of what you do is, is equipment and, and the building materials and everything that, that goes into constructing those is, is going up quite significantly. Staff 
are a lot more difficult to get hold of and, and, and the cost of that is rising. So do, do you feel that you're able to sort of maintain that positioning or do you think that because of some of these uncontrollable changes in, in the world that, that you may have to rethink that value proposition? Um, I don't think I get to decide that, unfortunately. I think that, you know, we, we, we tweak the price here and there, um, but it's it fundamentally comes down to, you know, price elasticity. It, that, that dictates the pricing. Um, what we know is, you know, th there, are two, there are two really key important numbers when you're looking at selling gym memberships, and that's how many people are paying you and how much are they paying. Uh, and, and it's as simple as that. And, and ideally, in a great business, you get both. You get, you get big member numbers on a big yield. But what you've always got to make sure that you do is you get a balance that, that ensures that the volumes are still there. I think, I think if I were to ask, it, is, is the gym business, is the gyms that we have, are the gyms that we have worth more than we charge? Of course they are. Of course they are. I mean, I, I was chatting to a friend last weekend and, and you, I think you struggle to, to get any parallel with anything else that, that carries the same value as a quality gym membership when you look at it. You know, it's, this is, you know, for, for some people, this is, a Starbucks lunch for two people, a sandwich and a coffee, and it's the price of a, of a, of a monthly membership. So, so the value, the, the value parallel doesn't really sit there. But, but competition and the demographic that you're pulling from, uh, and all those other factors are the reason why we charge what we charge because we, we believe that the price point that we have will give us the best returns. We, we've started to tweak the price in certain locations. We've just built our first organic J gyms in the south of England. We're very strong in the north and the middle of Scotland. Um, we have a few sites already in the surf, but there's those sites that we acquired through the exercise for less uh, business. But this is the first one, and, and, and the price is slightly slightly higher. And you know the, the model is slightly smaller, price is slightly higher, but we've got a phenomenal demand. And it's what's really encouraging is, is that it's in a location that there isn't another JD Gyms for probably 60 or 70 miles. So what it still proves to me is that the product is fresh enough that when we go into the right locations, that it that it that it's still really relevant. And, and really interestingly, it's when I look at the cameo profiling of the people in the area, it, it's pulling from a much more affluent demographic. Which again, you know, if you look at a typical JD Gyms member, and you had a kind of one to ten scale of of affluent to 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 not so affluent, you know, we are bottom half typically. But that becomes quite self-fulfilling when you build gyms in areas that, that that's got a huge prevalence of that of that type of consumer. So, so as we start to expand now into new territories, what's really encouraging is that we, we the product is still relevant regardless of, of, of kind of which which profile you come from. But yeah, I, I don't get to set the price, Matt. You know, it, fundamentally, I, it, it's it's a tap, isn't it? I turn the price up fifty percent, and you know, I look at how many people are paying it, and am I getting the same level of return? But, but what I will say is that, the, to, to answer your question a little bit, I think, is that I think where you started off was that these gyms look incredible. I think part of what you're, what you're saying there is they're clearly very well invested. Can you still afford to do that and only charge nineteen ninety nine? My argument to that is you can't afford not to do that because, <laughs> because otherwise you'll lose. And, and when you do that, we don't necessarily win on yield, but we definitely win on volume because we've, we've created a product that is, I suppose it's not for everybody, but in the demographic that we target, amongst those younger people, you know, the Instagrammable generation that, that, that sit there and want to, you know, want to want to be working out on the best equipment with the like-minded people. It's the same as the bars that they go, the, the bars that they frequent, and uh, and the people that they hang out with. They will they will drive past other low-cost competitors to get to us. And we couldn't do that if we weren't creating that product that I told you about in Birmingham or London or wherever it was, because I genuinely feel as though you know we needed to stand out. I I, I wanted to create a, a place that this generation can have a nice out as well as go for a workout, and that's what that's what we've done. I mean, I'm in our head office in Wigan here. We have a we have a twenty six and a half thousand square foot gym in here, and I still get really excited to go and training there. I'm 48 years of age. I reckon, you know, there's probably no more than three or four guys that'll be in there, probably older than me tonight. Yeah, that's the way it is. Um, but it's, but, but you know, for the right people, it's, it, it, it's just where they want to be. And, and if I, I can't do this business by cutting back on those those principles that I told you about 10 years ago, it's it's absolutely what what's got us where we are. And, and if anything, 
we will be we will be accelerating that into the next iteration of JD Gyms. We're already on with that because we've we've unquestionably had a had a few copycats and a, and a bit of a me too amongst you know some some mom and pop businesses over here that have that have built one or two and they've they've looked at some things that we've done and they've done it similar but but on a on a lower budget and, and been quite successful. Um, so we need to move it on. So, so so that's the next stage for us. It's constantly evolving. You know this this product here. This one that I'm, that I'm in today is six years old. If you were to come in today, it looks like it's six months old and it's still current and relevant because it was kind of ahead of its time. Um, but what in the next, you know, in the next batch, I think you'll be uh, you'll be surprised. Some of the things that you do, I, 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 and going back to sort of when I was in, you know, or probably when I used to just start working out in these sort of big box gyms, and the free weight area was always quite popular. And I know. Um, JJB and Fitness First, Group X was a key thing. And I know Group X is is a bit different to what it was then, but it, it's it's still the, the, the basics, the fundamentals are still the same. Uh, so free weights in your gyms now, I, I saw some pictures online and you've got about, I don't know how many benches, but I've never seen a gym with so many benches in, in the free weight areas ever, even in some of the big gyms that we get over in America. So are you seeing those gym trends still, are, is, are, are you still seeing the same things now where free weights is, is really important and group exercise or, or, or is that changing in any way? I still feel as though, you know, you have, you have a variety of different members, but for me and, and the kind of level of how discerning they are depends, you know, often can depend, I can look at the equipment that they use. And by discerning, what I mean is, is that are they walking into JD gyms because it just happens to be the one that's closest to home. And if somebody opens closer, if the relationship with my gym is to go on a cross trainer or to go on a piece of fixed resistance, it's very difficult for me to, for me to create something with that person other than through the staff or through the music atmosphere, that means that they will continue to come with us, you know, into the longer term if we start to get if start to get competitive. When you get it right for the for the free weights guys and girls, they kind of they kind of understand, they get it, and and they realise when a when a free weights area has been put together by by a set of people who who understand what it's like to train in there. Yeah, if that makes sense. So volume of benches, um, volume of, of the right sets of dumbbells, you know, putting the, putting the leg machines in the right, correct order, et cetera, all those things. The amount, of, the amount of comments that we get from people in our gyms that say, finally, someone's created a gym for me that feels as though I can still get all of those other things and it's still got that free weights area that I really need. We still, we still stop the dumbbells at 50 kgs. You know, there's an element there where when we took exercise for less, they had it up to I think it's 70 or 75. There's still, ele there's still elements of it that we want to make sure that it's, that it maintains that health club feel and we feel as though going beyond 50 can sometimes mean that 10 or 15 members that use the ones that are heavier can sometimes change the atmosphere in there a little bit but yeah i mean we the, the, the volume of benches that we put in is something that i started probably about five or six years ago but, but yeah we, we typically in a new gym will will put something like 28 multi benches 34 is the most we've done which is, but the funny thing is, though, as someone who loves using free weights, it, it's it's always amazed me how gyms will put three or four in there, and and you just for something that's so inexpensive compared to other equipment, how you know everyone uses a bench for something, you know nowadays they they're jumping on them and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But it's when when I saw that, I thought, well, I've never seen it before, and it was it was very interesting. But then I thought on on the other side, but I'm glad someone's just actually works out in the gym enough to realize yeah. that you need to make those bigger <laughs> well it's exactly what you just said it's the most inexp inexpensive piece of kit that we have in the gym and it's the, it's probably the most popular that and the treadmill so so yeah you know you go to gyms and you look at the fact that people are queuing for treadmills and you think god we need new treadmills at, at however much a treadmill costs depending on how many you're buying and who you're buying it from but when you see the same problem in a, in a free weights area you think hang on a second i can i can solve this pretty easily and pretty niftily what it does actually matter though is it changes things because what you find in the gyms that you're talking about where the gym, where the benches run out, yes, you can still get a similar volume of people, but it means that people have got to work in with others often. What what we'll sometimes find when the gym's a little quieter is three guys turn up to train together and they'll all press at the same time, which they quite like. So they'll press at the same time and then they'll chill out for a little bit at the same time and we'll have a we'll have a natter as opposed to one and then the other. So you, we watch the behaviours of members and we watch how they do it. 
obviously some of our gyms are very popular and even with 28 and 30 benches we can still get it pretty full but at that time it means that they can still get on a bench it just means that, they, that, that at that point they're working with each other and in reality i like it sometimes when i see a really really busy jd and i'll see four or five benches free that's a great sign for me because because people might look at that as a waste but i absolutely don't because it just means that we've we've made sure that those really discerning free weight members can get a pair of dumbbells in their hands and they can press because most of the guys in there they might not be able to get on the lap pull down or they might not be able to get on the piece of plate loaded but as long as they can get a pair of dumbbells in a bench they can pretty much do a full workout yeah, keeps them keeps them happy for a little while, doesn't it? And we bolt them to the floor as well to keep it in order. <laughs> that's that's the other thing. Yeah, I, I I did wonder that because I thought, God, who's going to be putting those back? So that's that's smart <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah, you need to bolt them to the floor. Yeah. Yeah. How much has social media influenced your your design? Because your younger demographic, they're on TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, and I've as I went through your your page and then clicked on some of the things that you guys had reshared and then looked at some of the people that were using it. There's, there's a lot of people that use your gyms that have got very big followings on Instagram and they work out in your gyms, um, pushing sleds and, and all that kind of stuff. So have you found as, as someone that's having to kind of decide where to go and what to put in that, that what's happening on social media, um, plays a, a key part in some of the decisions you're making for that, that gym floor design and, and the equipment choices as well. Um, the social media hasn't influenced how we design the gyms. How we design the gyms has given us a cool presence on social media. You know, we don't, when, when we're designing the gym, we don't think, how is this going to look on Instagram at, at any point? The, the gyms uh, are put together for the experiential element for the, for the members. You know, I want them to come in, you know, the, the, the atmosphere that they train in is the thing that makes them a want to come back and b tell their friends about it so the music has got to be bang on the content freshness of it the volume of it has got to be absolutely perfect so, so we spend we invest you know quite a lot of time into that we we need to make sure that the kit provision that you just talked into is right we need to make sure that the lighting is right because i want people to come and, and you know and have some escapism and, and and feel as though they're in a place that they just really, really want to come back to. You know, it's it still it, it still thrills me every time I see someone walk in for the first time and and, and see it and think, God, I want to train in here. You know, that 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 feeling that you get. There's only been a handful of gyms in my life that I've ever done that. I've walked in and thought, you know what, in the early days, I actually am going out tonight for a drink with friends, but I'd rather sit, I'd rather stay here and work out. Looks like more fun. So, so yeah, so the design is driven around the member experience. It isn't driven around how it will look on Instagram. A few of my younger guys in the marketing team have now started to say to me, we should stick this mirror here and we should do this because it looks great when they take a selfie. So, so, so there's little bits of my guys that are trying to influence it a little bit. Um, but yeah, no, I, I promise you it, it, is, it, is, it is absolutely style and function for, for the for the experience when you're here and it just so happens when you get that right people think it's pretty cool to take a picture and, and mm. share it on insta you know and i think i think that's, get flip that's signs. yeah I, I think that's that's i like that thought and and it's about I, I guess it comes back to making a fantastic product because if you make a fantastic product people are going to go and share it and and, and without question when you look at if you were going to do an instagram video or picture and and you want it to look cool and people to share it then you want a really cool background and and the stuff that i've seen because I'm, I'm someone that does a lot of filming and and that kind of thing for our own business is is it's it all the bits that you want in the picture are kind of there and it makes it easy for it to look like a cool post. So I, so I, but I, I like what you said, the way that you come about it is not to make it look good on, on Instagram, is, is to make something look good that people are just going to want to come and be involved in and share and, and, and look at, which is, yeah, which is would, quite a cool yeah, approach. I, I, would, I wouldn't have, you know, when we first designed it, it, you know, Instagram wasn't the thing that it is today. So, so seven years ago, when we started this business. We were still designing the gyms along this way so but that's that's kind of evolved so, social media the biggest the biggest uh, influence it's had on us is just the the way that we sell memberships now that that you know as opposed to to designing the gym to, to look cool on instagram it's you know the, the biggest benefit that we've had is that those old school traditional selling methods are are really no more and, and, and for us it's it is a billboard for our products it's the thing that we put on there that, that means that people truly understand what we have and, and we can reach 
the target audience pretty easily. And that's the thing with social media that, that enables us to, to do what we do and, and to, to, to be as, as successful as we are. So with with the boutique space, I understand, and I may not have this exactly correct, but you've got a you've got a clubbing club concept called Burn. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, you could call it clubbing club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and is so is that sort of is that like a your version of a, of creating a boutique feel um, within the you know the the four walls of a traditional fitness club? Uh, no, not really. Um, okay. <laughs> I can see why you would think it though, so I think it's a good question. Um, but it's funny enough. It, again, the first one that we did is is in this is in our hometown club here in Wigan. And interestingly, Matt, I know you haven't listened to the reason why you've asked the question, but but it was in conjunction with Escape that we did this one. I did some work with. It was it was on your website, so I, and I've got some core bags on there. So I thought, okay, yeah. well that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Look, look, I know this market really well. I was I was, I was born here. Yeah, I live I live a little little outside it now but um but i know the market really well and it's it's a heartland of, of, of a place that people want to train really hard and get results you know this is you know they don't want to they don't want to kind of mess around they want to get in they want to make the most of the workout and get results and when we built this this gym interestingly because i knew the mark the local market so well i felt as though some of the bigger competitors that we had were small pt um led group x you know, areas that you have in, in industrial sheds, there was probably five or six of them that were charging 60, 80, 90 quid sometimes a month for fundamentally, you know, sledgehammers and hitting tires and tire flips and, and all that type of stuff. So so what I try to create here is, is is a kind of halfway ground between what you would see in a normal health club style group X and something that was as hardcore as that. So we came up with JD Byrne at that point. So it, it is it is a, a very efficient arena in which I can push a lot of people through a quality hit workout in 40 minutes. So, so that's different to a boutique feel. It's, 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 I want them to feel a little more hardcore in it. So JD burn is very much about getting here and you burn calories and you know, you, you torch fat and you, you get a leaner, cooler, sexier body on the back of it, which is, so it's not, it's not so much about the experience. It's about the end result. Yeah, right. If that makes and sense. is that something that comes part of the membership? Or, yeah, of course. Or yeah, do, no, it, 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 it comes as part of the membership. So, so around a quarter of our sites have got bespoke bird studios that are AstroTurf and, and, and Mesh and Orange Neons with JD Bird. And in the, in, in, the, in the places that we don't have the space, we, we effectively have a combi studio. So in those studios, we still have the lines on the floor. So you'll still run body pump and you're still running yoga and Pilates in those studios. But we can effectively change the lighting and we can make it look different and, we, and the orange lights come on and we change the atmosphere change the music and we still run burn in those in those studios as well it's the experience is not quite as impactful but yeah it's great i mean more more and more i'm seeing a change probably in our group x offering now i think that a lot of the traditional stuff there is still a definite place for it because otherwise i'd alienate a certain section of the demographic that i don't want to lose completely but yeah, m more of the more of the classes that involve strong, uh, exciting hit workouts is definitely something that we are seeing more and more demand for. You know, I'm I'm still very much driven by what I see the members demanding, as opposed to always trying to innovate and put new concepts. You know, when when the industry first started putting rigs in gyms, you know, we we genuinely as an industry decided that that was a really cool way to train put them into gyms and then had to educate the audience to say this is how you should train you know that, that that's moved on now and people get it and they understand you know i'm i'm still very much of i look at what the members are looking for we we, we see the classes that are popular we pivot the timetable in that direction we look at the free weights area we see the pinch points we look on the cardio we we we, we do we still watch member behaviors and try and just stay one step ahead and give them give them what they what, what they want without being so innovative that it ends up confusing people. Mm. And I know the the guy like Exercise for Less you mentioned, obviously that's a brand you purchase and one of the guys who was working there looks as though he's gone on to create almost like a low cost boutique model, um, which I'm, I, I don't know too, too much about, but it's interesting that people are trying to sort of create some value there. I just wondered, it, you know, based on what you've said about Burn then, do, do you see that the evolution of, I guess, that kind of category is that where you used to have your, um, I don't know, your circuit training in a, or your step class in a studio, that those spaces are still going to be there as part of your 
big box offering, but that's going to become part of the membership. But instead of doing step and circuits, you're going to be doing more of these these type of classes that you've created with Burn. Then, yeah, I think I think there's still a place for that. I still I still I still firm believer. You know, we've got as much as I've told you before around the youthfulness of our demographic and and, and how kind of into the training they are there's still enough people out there who want to fundamentally come along and do a Les Mills class or they want to do a spinning class or they want to do uh, yoga or, 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 or body attack or anything like that. So yeah, I still think that's important, but I don't think that that's necessarily so much of the anchor of the timetable with the odd hit class or circuit class that you used to get, you know, one on a Wednesday night at eight o'clock. I think the difference, I think more and more people want to go to the gym and see a result. So when those people want to go to the classes, you know, you and I both know we've been in it long enough. If, if, you know, if you were recommending a class to someone who said, I want to burn some fat, I want to look leaner, I want to, I want to get fitter, it, we know the ones that are going to get the results better, you know, the, the ones that perhaps are a little bit more fun, I suppose, the ones that are a bit more relaxing. But the more the more educated people become and the more that, that this becomes, you know, a byproduct of getting the, the result at the end of it, then that's when they realise that the classes that work are the ones that that are similar to burn that's why we see more and more of them coming onto the timetable because people don't want to go to the same class for six weeks and say see, see no results they want to come in and they want to they want to feel firmer off the back of mm. it so, so yes but but i genuinely still feel as though that the traditional studio is still here to stay i mean we we we, we care passionately about that we feel as i talked about the free weight members being discerning i also think that the, the group x members are pretty pretty discerning and their relationship with the gym becomes more than just the hardware. They get a relationship with the instructor. You know, that's why we, we're still a, a big advocate of face-to-face -face classes or the virtual. Um, because, yes, you can get a great workout from a virtual um, a virtual platform, but nothing will, will ever be, you know, turning up on a miserable Tuesday night and, and being inspired by, by a real person at the front of the room. So with those two areas free weights and, and the group X and the evolution of that. My, my guess then is, is in terms of the people getting results and the, the, the business case for, for retention and, 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 and bringing people through the doors then, sounds like if, if done correctly, those are, those are still a huge influence in, in making the, the, the fitness, a fitness uh, business um, work, is, is, that, is that a correct statement? Would you people, say? Well, the fact that people, the people come in to get results have well people getting results but but how do they get results well by having the, the sort of people who probably go into the free weight area because they're sure, yeah. sort of just a fairly loyal group and then then the other group which are, which are getting them into a group exercise class having the instructor and and using that to sort of keep them motivated to ensure they come back and ultimately get results so are those sort of like two key things that you still feel as an industry uh, are, are fundamental to making a gym um, successful. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, all the things I talk about, you know, cool lighting, great music, and you know, all those things that we've talked about to, as we've chatted, they're all really important, but you've got to remember why people are coming in the first instance. You know, what, why are gyms busier in January than they are at other times of the year? Because as people are out of shape and they want to do something about it. And, you know, so we mustn't lose sight of the fact that, that we're still in the, still a results business you know yes of course certain people are going to are going to turn up and and it becomes you know a bit of part of the social life but, but yeah you know it, it can be it can be someone who's just doing it to try and be healthier get a little fitter it could be somebody who's trying to lose weight it, be, it could be a young guy who's trying to who's trying to build some muscle whatever it is this is the, the environment that i'm creating here and the jd gym team are creating here is all part and parcel of, of you know it, it's 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 tough. Training is tough. You know, you can't get can't get a great set of biceps by doing twenty press ups. You've got to keep coming back. You've got to keep doing it again and again and again and again and again. And at times when you're sacrificing other things, so so what I'm trying to do is make the environment as as cool as possible, somewhere that you want to come because there are like minded people. It looks great. It sounds great. It's clean. The equipment all works. The staff are really friendly, so that it makes it easier for you to come and get the results that you came here to do. I don't want to put any obstacles in your way. I don't want any sticky points. I don't want it to be that it's, yeah, I really want to go to that gym, but I can't park, the staff are miserable, it's always dirty, the equipment's broken, the music's not very good, it's not very inspiring, they're not my type of people. So, so, so yeah, the, you've, got to, you've got to realize that that's why they are coming. 
and then do everything in the meantime to make them want to continue to come. Mm. In terms of innovation, how do you know when to move on a big idea? Because as you say, there was, there's the functional rigs, there's, there's tons of equipment, there's, there's a lot of concepts that are talked about and having a lot of money put into them. But some of them work, some of them don't, some of them are bad, badly executed. And I guess with, in, you know, in your position, uh, there's, there's a lot on the line for you and your team if you, if, you get it, if you get it wrong, particularly when it's a new facility. So how do you approach innovation in terms of a big idea? I'm not talking about adding some extra benches, but a, but a, a sort of a big, big change to the model. And then would you class yourselves as more of a, of a leader in terms of those ideas and trends or, or more of a fast follower where you, you sort of identify these things, wait, wait until you really figured out how to, to make it work and then start testing it through your organization? Instinct uh, would, be the, would be the main thing that I'll say into that. You know, we, we have a, we have a, a say in the business where we test and learn. I think it's easy to test and learn when you're bigger. I think the challenge in that comes when you're a smaller business, if you've got three or four uh, units, three or four gyms, to start to do something that com that's completely groundbreaking and different, particularly if you're being successful at that point, I think is is a big call. More and more now as we start to feel it's it's going into new territories, it's going into smaller boxes for us, it's, it's altering the price point, it's changing the design, it's changing the orientation of the gyms. You know, we're, we, we are considering some... At gyms at the moment that are significantly smaller than the ones that we currently have, so we'll we'll have to innovate in that. But but ultimately, instinctively, if it feels right, we go for it, and if it doesn't, we don't. So we don't follow trends that we don't believe. I, you know, we, we um, I'm a great believer that success leaves clues. So whilst we don't copy people, we admire success when people get something right. And, and where someone gets it right, we would look to improve on it and do it in a in a kind of JD iteration of that. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't say we are um, we're, we're necessarily a me too or a copycat in that. But we 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 got our ears open um, and we got our eyes open. We listen to to what's going on in the industry. We we get out. We we you know we get in the car. We burn the rubber. We look at what's going on. And, and yeah, we, we, we follow trends and we, um, we, we see how we can iterate, make it better for JD gyms. Um, but instinct would be my, my core part of that. We would never do something that we feel as though the industry is doing. And being, being really straight with you, Matt, I think in the UK, the boutique concept was, it was a great example of that. People, the amount of times I got asked about, is JD going to open standalone JD Burn? Are you going into boutique space? And it just, it, we just didn't feel it. You know, we just did, we just never felt it. We, it I'm sure there, there are, there are businesses that are very London centric that understand that market really, really well and we'll get it right. Yeah. But, but as far as the rest of the UK goes, we, we would have been potentially a fast follower if we genuinely seen a model that we'd respected and, and, and thought that was really successful in that. And, and, and looking back on it, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the decision that we took, you know, we, it's, we, we, we genuinely at that point didn't really see it for us as much as everybody in the, everybody in the industry was talking about nothing but boutique two or three years ago and you've got to be boutique, you've got to be boutique. And, and we were sitting here thinking, well, actually, we're pretty, pretty happy with what we've got. Let's do some, let's do some uh, super cool looking big boxes and play some cool music and make sure everyone can get some equipment. Alan, as a leader, like you've gone, you've had to lead a team of people through a pandemic, which, which couldn't have been easy in the slightest when you, you're having to close down your business and not know when it's going to open again and, and open and close and, and everything else that's going on. And you've also made a, a, a pretty significant uh, acquisition, as you mentioned before, with, with Exercise for Less and, and now recently um, the, 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 the one in the UAE. How have you navigated this process as a leader because you've not only had to guide people through this and, and keep because it's you're in a people business at the end of the day um but also bringing on a, a a very big business tried to kind of get i get i guess get the culture of, of the new organization over to a lot of the people in in the new business and and keep the ship running at the same time through a difficult period what, what's that been like and what are some of the key things that you've had to do and grow into to to, to be as successful as what you could have been through that journey? Gosh, it's been tough, Matt. 
you know the last the last few years particularly to the pandemic you know I, gosh I, I recall those moments in that we had some phenomenal weather in the first lockdown in the UK and and I would sit and talk to my peers and and you know sit and working from home which is an alien concept to me I've never done it before um I'm, I'm fundamentally a guy who likes to get out and about um yeah yeah it was tough I, I think a lot a lot of leaders will tell you this but but I'm surrounded by some incredible people and I wouldn't pretend that I've done it all on my own at the time you know the, the vast majority of our staff were furloughed but Amelia, the commercial director, and Darren, the property director, and uh, you know, we're, we're very much by my side through all of that. And 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 as a as a three man team, which is which is very much what we are, we 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 kind of you know regrouped, we 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 repositioned ourselves, we understood what we've got to what we've got to got to do differently, and uh, and we somehow made our way through that. As we get as we get bigger, what how has it changed me? The the challenge that I've got is. I think a lot of a lot of people who've been in a small business has grown to a big business. Well, certainly quite a big business that's growing into a phenomenally big business. Find it difficult to relinquish and let go certain things that they that they owned from the start. So so I suppose one of the things that I've had to learn is to trust is to is to surround myself with great people and trust the decisions that they make. So becoming allowing people to become more autonomous than they've been before. Um, but we have, you know, we have a, we have a huge amount of accountability in our business. I'm, I'm a, I'm a former sportsman, and I'm, a lot of the things that I learned as a rugby, a rugby player are very much the way that I that I run this dressing room in here today, which is that we we celebrate our successes together as a team. No matter, no matter which individual created it, the team celebrated together. But but when we when we stuff something up, we look at each other in the eye and we understand that when it's that person, they they stick their hand in the air and. And for me, it's really important that you get a philosophy amongst your team of trust and accountability. And, and I think that as a leader, that's the thing that I foster. And that's the thing that I try and nurture amongst the guys here. I want them to be really confident in what they do. I don't want people to walk into work and be fearful of making any decisions in case they get one wrong. You know, if people aren't making the odd wrong decision, it means they aren't making decisions. You know, and I'm not, I, I'm not employing people here to be to, to just either be yes men or to or to coast along to, to use a sporting analogy i often talk about this being a high performing sports team and it's not for everyone that you know we the, the bigger the, the bigger that we get the more the more pressure that we put on these people but the more that we we attract people that want to work in high pressured situations I often find that a lot of people think that they want to work in a high performing business until they get into it. And actually they like the idea of, of working in a high performing business. Same with the sports team. The reason why a lot of great young sportsmen and women don't go on to make it is because when it gets when it gets a little tough and the pressure gets gets hot, no matter how much talent they've got, you, you've got to have the want to be there. And and so I suppose my, you know, my job more than anything is that as opposed to playing an instrument, I'm now playing the orchestra and I'm making sure that the the guys that work in my team have got the tools at their disposal to do what what they need to do. I give them the confidence to to go ahead and make some decisions and to think big. And and I suppose that's as a leader, that's the thing, as opposed to when I started off pretty much alone and solo with a with a, a business plan and an idea and a, uh, and, a, and, a and a concept. It's very different, and, and that transition is it is something that that takes some time. But but I genuinely feel that, particularly over the last year, it, it's something that, that that we've really landed on, and, and I'm really excited for the next stage of where we can take that because the acquisitions that you've seen are at the end of it. We're now going to pivot off into into a few different directions in in, in the leisure space, which are which are really cool and really exciting, and. Yeah, and, and the brand is supporting us on that, which is which is really great. Have you found a successful way of communicating to people from you know it was before a very small group, I guess, and you could like you say you could have probably got around all the clubs and had that personal contact, but now it's it's much bigger, and you probably traveling, particularly international, isn't what it used to be. Have, have you had to find or have you found a, an effective way of just keeping that sort of personal touch and, and connection right through the organisation? I spend a lot of time talking to talking to my middle and senior management about things beyond how many sales did we do yesterday and what's the plan for tomorrow and where do we think we're going to be at the end of the month. 
so so a lot of the things that that you know a lot of the the concepts upon which the business is built my key team understand that and i expect them to go out and deliver it when i when i turn up at the club to talk to every member of staff don't care who you are i don't walk into the club and talk to the manager and i, and I try and get people to understand if i see a piece of litter on the floor i pick it up on the front of the bin if the toilet or the sinks aren't clean i wipe it and and, and do it myself and I want people to understand that this is as much as you can become an MD of, a, of an organisation. You never, you never lose the fact that that you know at some point you clean the sinks and do the tours. So I think that helps. You know, I think that helps. In the you know more recently, we've had some some issues with younger, newer PTs into the business that see the brand, they see the product, they think it's all some just big glossy corporation, and and decide that they're kind of. Um, too important to clean treadmills or do do those other things, and, and and I ask them a very basic question, and I say, okay, if I walk in here as the MD of the company, and the treadmill's dirty, and you see me clean it, do you gain respect or do you lose respect? And they all say we gain respect. I said, so what makes you think as a PT that your clients will lose respect for seeing you cleaning the tools upon which you do your work? I just don't get it. And it, and it's and it's those very simple values that we have. I just try as much as possible. To ensure that the regional management team, the cluster managers, the senior general managers understand that that's what we're about, and, and just try and make sure that people stay grounded, because it's it's really easy in a business to see being successful. You know, they read the press about JD, they understand that we are obviously pretty successful in the, in the growth. It's very difficult that they don't become it's it's almost like a um, a bit akin to a victimless crime, if you know what I mean. If they if they don't bother doing the book, what does it really matter to this organisation? Well, it well it matters an awful lot to, to me and the team around me that have, that have spent, um, you know, that spend every hour God sends um, thinking about it, trying to harness it, trying to make it better, you know, all those things. So we we just try and make sure that the senior management are going out there and keeping people's feet on the ground and making sure that they understand that that. That's the kind of premise on which the business has been founded, and we don't want to lose it. And, and you know, the, within the PLC, it, it's very similar. Peter, the, the chairman of the group business, is is, is very similar. He's, very, he's a very grounded individual, and it's a uh, and it's something that, that we that we find it easy to to try and mirror. Great culture. Final question, Alan. Escape yeah. your limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. Outside of what we spoke about, what would be a recent memorable example of where you've escaped your own personal limits? I suppose uh, recently, on a from a family perspective, uh, taking the bold decision to to move up to the the English Lake District. So it's a place that we love. It's a place that, as a family, uh, we feel as though we can get ourselves as grounded as we as we as we possibly can. And it's a it's a brilliant place for me to personally escape. Um, so yeah, so my my very brave 16 year old son has taken the, the bold leap. It's it's not not very far from home. It's just over an hour, but it means that he's turning his back on his friends, and, I, and I'm incredibly proud of him. So so yeah, so as a family, I think that, that the pandemic made us reevaluate um, certain elements of, uh, of of life beyond work and, and all the other bits. That, um, so this summer we we take the move and we and, and we move up to the Lake District, and I'm I'm really excited, looking forward to it. Fantastic. Well, Alan, thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward. We, we must catch up when I get back to England. I'll have to, what, what's one of your newest clubs that I need to come and see when I get back? Um, well, the new club we're opening in Bury next week. Uh, so that's, that's a really exciting one because Bury is the hometown of JD. So, so it's only a mile away from head office. So it's a, you know, it's a pretty cool club that we're opening down there. Yeah, or, or one in the south, we're opening one in uh, just outside of Gillingham at a place called Hempstead, Hempstead Valley. Um, okay. Both, both going to be pretty cool. All right. I'll be sure to check them out. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, best wishes uh, and congratulations on what you've done. That, that, um, that chat around the bar and, uh, and what, what it's uh, turned into is, uh, is extremely impress impressive. So, uh, so well done. No, good. I hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed the chat as, as much as I did. Thanks, Matt. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.